Uh, hello, friends. It's uh, it's me, Will. I'm joined by Matt. Uh, it's just us this week, but you Felix fanatics out there, please, please don't rush for the exits because we've got a great guest for you sitting in uh, this week. Collecting his two-time Chapo guest appearance challenge coin, <laughs> joining us now is John Dolan, a.k.a. The War Nerd, a.k.a. Gary Brecher. John, so nice to uh, talk to you again. How you doing? I'm great. I'm honored to be back on the show. Uh, it's great to talk to you. Uh, in a little bit, I think we'll be taking a uh, a brief tour around the uh, the wide world of Warcraft uh, with the War Nerd. Uh, but before before we get there, I mean, I we just got to talk about this this Jeffrey Epstein shit because I mean I've been following it. We talked about it a little bit over the weekend, but like since then, the case has only gotten weirder. And you know, if you've been listening to us, I'm sure you're familiar with the details of this case, but. The question I'm asking myself now, as more and more of this stuff comes out, is pre prior to, I had assumed that, you know, he was a billionaire hedge fund guy whose wealth allowed him to uh, get away with all right, these ghastly yeah. crimes and shield him from any sort of prosecution or anyone looking too deeply into it. But now, as more is revealed about his quote unquote hedge fund, the question needs to be asked, was he a billionaire because he was doing crimes or was it the other way around? Like, it's very hard to say because apparently there's almost no evidence that he had a hedge fund at all. Yeah, he was a he was a quant at Bear Stearns and then he just got plucked out of nowhere by Les Wexner, the, the kingpin of Victoria's Secret, given power of attorney and a mansion by him. And then shortly after he popped open this hedge fund, that was only he said it was they said it was only for people who had a billion dollars to invest and it immediately became incredibly popular even though there were only 13 billionaires in America in the 1980s it's like where the fuck did the money come from and not from? only that but like also he his hedge fund employed no analysts mm -mm. or like anything like that that would be like didn't on publish the results either like didn't publish a record of its performance and that he got power of attorney over all of his clients yes. which is also very odd and I guess like the broader question is, at what point can you say that like the the sort of pop culture because you know you know you know us like I'm very into James Elroy and conspiracy theories like True Detective and shit like that. At what point can you say that like the the pop culture depiction of like the the world of power and its depravity is in fact not adequate? Isn't like not only not exaggerated, but in fact not adequate to convey the scope of evil at the highest levels of like financial, military, political, and quite frankly, entertainment power. Like, it, like, is there any, like the girl with the dragon tattoo or the Red Riding trilogy from Britain? I remember when I first saw those movies, I was just like, wow, that was scary and evil. But you know what? Mm, it's a bit too much. You know, is it, is it really realistic? But the more you learn about this shit, it's just like, no, they were, if anything, like not broad enough in their imaginations. So if, if I, I'm in, I've been out of the country a lot, so I'm sort of new to this. But if I'm understanding this properly, the implication is they put him in place as a pimp for extremely rich guys who like pubescent girls. Yeah. But what's more than that, like the, the question again is like, was he a pimp or was he just running a blackmail racket? Because if you're just a pimp, you are for like the most powerful people in the world and they feel the slightest bit of pressure, you're instantly disposable. Right. There was the case, of course, of the DC madam, the one who brought down David Vitter and his diaper fetish, who, um, you know, killed herself yeah. uh, in, under suspicious circumstances. I think it's double. I think for the, the billionaire types, it's just it's a it's a transaction. You know, he 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 gives them access to uh, discreet access to to what they want. And then they park their money in his hedge fund and he collects a, a percentage of it. But then for people like the Clintons uh, and, uh, you know, the political figures and the, and the entertainment figures, it does have the function of being the protective layer, like the thing that like, makes it impossible to, like, they could be comfortable that this isn't going to come back to them because it's just too big of a, a can of worms to open if he ever gets arrested, which is exactly what happened the first time he got nailed uh, in the, in the team, in the, in the aughts. And that, you know, now the, the guy who presided over that sweetheart deal in which he went, did 13 months of like work release, you know, day camp prison, mm -hmm. most of which he spent in his office in New York. 
it was like the Dinesh D'Souza thing. Like, you go to jail on the weekends, and, you know, he was traveled out of state, and in, including to his fucking, you know, the Virgin Islands while he was supposedly incarcerated. Uh, Alexander Acosta, who's currently Trump's labor secretary, was the guy who made that deal. And as we've talked about before, the big part of that deal was not the fact that he did almost no actual hard time for the scale of the crimes he was accused of, is that it immediately stopped any further federal investigation into his co-conspirators. And like he was given a deal, as you said, Matt, not to squeal on people, but to not squeal on people. Right, yeah. Preemptive immunity for anyone unnamed co-conspirators involved. That's the exact opposite of, of how any prosecution of a, of a conspiracy case ever goes. And Acosta, of course, is now Trump's labor secretary, who had the balls to tweet today that he's very proud of the Southern District of New York for, <laughs> you know, uh, picking this up. Or he said, you know, we prosecuted him or whatever. Uh, Nancy Pelosi, of course, said today about Acosta that the Democrats will not be pursuing impeachment against him. You can impeach a, ca a cabinet secretary yes. just as well easily as you can do a president. And they are not going to impeach or even look into that at all. Well, that's said, smart on her part, though. I mean, you can't blame her for that. Like, this is the thing. Like, I see people criticize Pelosi all the time. And I really think that you don't understand what her job is. Her job is to protect this party and this caucus. Why would she open an investigation that might end up revealing a video broadcast on all networks of, like, Bill Clinton wearing a ceremonial headdress, like, eating a baby's brain like an apple? Like, they don't... That's not good for her party. That's not good for her agenda. So she's not going to do it. Like, you're asking something of someone for whom th it's diametrically opposed to their entire... Uh, their whole pr uh, portfolio. Uh, so, like, there was a New York... Uh, th this was sort of going around this week. New York Magazine had a profile of Epstein uh, that was published in 2002 that is certainly interesting to read now. Uh, it begins by writing here. Um, this is by uh, Landon Thomas Jr., and the headline is Jeffrey Epstein, International Money Man of Mystery. He comes with, a, with cash to burn, a fleet of airplanes, and a keen eye for the ladies, to say nothing of a relentless brain that challenges Nobel Prize winning scientists across the country and for financial markets around the world. Ever since the post is, page six ran an item about the president's late September visit to Africa with Kevin Spacey and Chris Tucker on the, his benefactor's customized Boeing 727. The question of the day it has been, who in the world is Jeffrey Epstein? It goes on to talk about, um, uh, quoting someone here, it says, my belief is that Jeff maintains some sort of money management firm, though you won't get a straight answer from him, says one well-known investor. He once told me he had 300 people working for him, and I've also heard he manages Rockefeller money, but no one ever knows. It's like looking at the Wizard of Oz. There may be less there than meets the eye. Uh, here's Clinton speaking of uh, Epstein. He goes, Jeffrey is both a highly successful financier and a committed philanthropist with a clean, keen sense of global markets and an in-depth knowledge of 21st century science, Clinton says through a spokesman. I especially appreciated his insights and generosity during the recent trip to Africa to work on democratization, empowering the poor, citizen service, and combating HIV AIDS. So Clinton, of course, Bill Clinton has now released a statement saying that he knew nothing of these ghastly crimes and has only been on, quote, four trips on Jeffrey Epstein's planes, which, of course, uh, refers to an itinerary that covers a way more than just four appearances on that airplane. So, again, like, think about how close the Clintons are to this guy and then also how close Trump is, as we've mentioned on our last show. There was a lawsuit that alleged that Trump raped a 13-year-old girl in Jeffrey Epstein's apartment that was dropped under, again, very suspicious circumstances. We know Trump's famous quote that he gave in this article about Jeffrey Epstein, where he said, we all know Jeffrey loves his social life. He loves girls, Epstein, many on the young side. Epstein was asked in a deposition uh, if he'd ever attended a party with uh, Trump and underage girls, and he pled the fifth. Uh, I mean, again, hard, hard to know where to go with all of this, but I just keep coming back to the movie Chinatown and John Huston's Noah Cross character in that movie as just like a kind of singular portrayal of American evil and depravity that what comes with money and power is just like not just the will, but like the means to do anything for which there is like, you know, no limits to you whatsoever. Why are you doing it? How much better can you eat? What can you buy that you can't already afford? The future, Mr. Gitz. The future. Now, where's the girl? I want the only daughter I've got left. As you found out, Evelyn was lost to me a long time ago. Who do you blame for that, her? 
I don't blame myself. See, Mr. Gitz, most people never have to face the fact that at the right time and the right place, they're capable of anything. Well, when, when I think about limits, I think, is there anything outside this system? I mean, you know, we get a lot of talk about how media can suddenly um, explode somebody who's been getting away with this for a long time. I mean, in theory, it would take one leak of one video from that island, right, mm -hmm. with a few famous faces on it. But there doesn't seem to be anybody with the will or the means to leak that video. Well, in the past week, also, we've had people basically say that, you know, I was at Vanity Fair or New York Magazine. And it was Vicki Ward, I think, at Vanity Fair. Yeah. Who said that uh, you know she had she did a profile of Epstein that included you know uh, al allegations from some of his now accusers that uh, Graydon Carter axed at the last minute mm -hmm. because he got you know worried for whatever reason or there have been other profiles of which these accusations were all out there but essentially the editors all got cold feet because it couldn't quite pass the, like the the fact checking process well, they like, worried what? about getting sued or you know going getting too far out in front of something so like all this was like basically known by a lot of the people in the media but like what like a guy like Graydon Carter he's a satellite for New York money right like that's his he's just this parasite he he offers no value anybody could be in charge of these dumb glossy magazines discretion is part of his actual uh what he offers to these people yeah. and the moment he doesn't have that offer that anymore right. he ceases to be useless at all useful at all and so he's he's out the door and yet something happened in florida right i mean there's i'm 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 the voice of the ignorant masses here because i i have a very vague memory of all this but something happened in florida that was an actual legal proceeding that got him the ultimate slap on the wrist like you have to show up mm for eight hours a day uh, because you did something with it was underage a, it was, girls. It was a solicitation okay. charge in Florida, and, yeah. that, and that's what he served his 13 months of like work release. It's a classic case where it, it's like ground, ground level police work. I think like one of the, some of the victims came forward to local law enforcement. They interviewed Epstein. They, in, they got a search warrant. They went to the house. They found a ton of incriminating stuff, including, if I remember correctly, one of the high school report cards of one of the girls in his house, uh, and then it got you know kicked up to the state level, and then the feds got involved, and then it was this classic thing where you have pressure from below at the at the local level for a conviction, and then all of a sudden this pressure from above from the federal level to just shelve it. And not only that, but after he had served his quote unquote time, you know, mostly in in New York in his office, and he returned to New York again to just basically start again doing whatever he's been what he's been doing the last 20 30 years the manhattan da cy vance explicitly went against the recommendations of uh the prosecutors in the case that he be designated a level three sex offender which is the highest possible level you can be which basically marks you as a you know a danger to a clear and present danger to others around you Cy Vance went out of his way to make sure he got the level one designation, which is the like the softest one. I think he might have ended up getting the, the level three anyway, but I do know that the Cy Vance tried his hardest to intervene to get him to be a one. Either way, it's a sign that, I mean, we know this, that the Manhattan DA's office is just a concierge service for Manhattan's richest scumbags. I mean, again, like if the Trump years are showing us anything, it's that, like, like the mask is completely falling off. Yep those in power and those who serve them and that like there, there seems to be a desperate desperate fight to put it back yeah. on from many of the people who have been assuring those of us on the left or with any progressive values that like they're the ones who've been saying for years you know like politics is really just all about power you don't understand that like you'll need like you're an ideal 